Hello, and welcome to Friends for Life, a podcast of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod's Life Ministry. We're sharing the stories and insights of real people living out God's love for the people He's created. We hope you'll stick around and be our friends for life. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Stephanie Jabauer. With no doubt, I can say that most people listening know about the war raging on in Ukraine and have probably seen photos and heard news clips of the devastation that's happened since the war began in early 2022. Most of us probably feel pretty helpless in these situations, uh, wishing there was, there was something we could do, some kind of difference we could make, but global impact often feels very out of reach. Not only does the church pray for wars to end, we also pray for the families affected by war, many of whom have become displaced as their home is literally no longer safe to live in. Our guests are here to talk about the Christian's care for refugees and how a Christian lens enlarges our care and compassion for these neighbors. Pastor Kelly, welcome. Would you please introduce yourselves? Absolutely. I'm uh, Chris Asbury and senior pastor of Grace Lutheran Church in Norfolk, Nebraska. And my wife, Kelly, and I have been married 21 years and have five beautiful kids. And uh, God has given us good work to do in Norfolk and uh, we love it to pieces. And why did we have you on today to talk about our care for refugees and our Ukrainian neighbors? Well, it's amazing uh, how the the work God has given you to do in advance is nothing that you would predict. And in the midst of uh, trials and tragedies, we have an opportunity to care for people that we never thought we would meet, uh, had to find where they lived on a map, <laughs> and turns out we can actually do something. So when God gives you opportunity and, and you pray for those opportunities, ask for wisdom, what can we do? You step forth in faith to do your best. So over a year ago, as the war began and we started hearing stories of, of people um, needing help, um, Orphan Grain Train was able to reach out to connections in the region and find ways to get aid to people there. But then it became apparent that we might need to try and help get people out. And if you get people out, uh, refugees need homes and they need care and safety. Um, and depending on the individuals or families, they may need long-term care and safety. And when it comes to uh, enjoying the freedoms that we have, if they're able to uh, move here, we're able to help them become independent. So when we began this journey, Orphan Grain Train uh, identified families that they thought could come to Nebraska and um, started the process of filling out paperwork. I initially got involved with filling out the I-134, which is a government form under the Uniting for Ukraine program. Every family had to have a financial supporter in order to come, and Orphan Grain Train found financial supporters who were willing. Um, they didn't necessarily have to financially support them because Orphan Grain Train was willing to, but they were willing to step up and under the government's eye be a financial supporter. Um, and I filled out all the paperwork for them. And once they were approved, the families with a lot of paperwork and a lot of waiting eventually bought plane tickets and made their way to Nebraska. And even when they got here, there was a lot more paperwork that had to be done. We filled out work permits, we enrolled them in Medicaid, we enrolled them in food stamps. There were physicals. There was all kinds of paperwork we had to do. Um, we enrolled them in schools. Um, and on top of all that paperwork, we also had to have places for them to live. A lot of things were thought of. And there were a lot of people that helped. Countless volunteers set up the house that they lived in, um, took them places, helped them with food, I don't know. There were so many people that were involved. Yeah, and, and in some ways that was just the get-go and then there, um, the, the beginning of it all. And then there have been even more people with the continued care. We, we had a, a variety of groups as sponsors and we tried to cluster people and group people in the types of ways that they felt comfortable getting involved. 
So there was very much the the folks that could say, yes, I can I can commit financially uh, t- to help make this happen, or at least have the financial background for the paperwork. Usually those people were very much wanting to be connected in person as well. And there are, they are people here, but then we have a whole bunch of other folks who um, are those who, you know, they, they say, you know, I can help with rides because guess what? When you move to America, rightfully so, you can't get a license right away. <laughs> we also found it in Nebraska. Initially, they could not get a license for two years. That has changed, luckily. There's a state, they finally passed a state law that allowed them to get a driver's license now. But um, our first group of refugees couldn't get a driver's license. Which means if, if the bus system was working, then they could use the bus system. Otherwise, you can't just say, you all come here and good luck. No, um, we are very much committed long term. And we, but we had individuals say, yes, I'd, I'd be willing to help drive them to school or to doctor's appointments or to go shopping. Um, all the while you have, for many of them, the, the language barrier, a totally new language for some, or a language that maybe they had a year or two in school and learned and, and can get around a little bit. So the, the groups of people have been tremendous help. I think number one in all that, the, the people have seen the love of Christ. In fact, the folks that, as they moved here, they had totally freedom, total freedom to worship wherever they wanted, but many have stuck at our church because, in their own words, like I didn't pay them to say this, they, they said, we see the love of Christ here. You know, that was without any pressure to expect anything. We simply want to serve these uh, once strangers who are now friends and people that we love. Um, What's interesting is when this was first brought up as an idea, we thought that we had an opportunity through a government program to bring a whole plane load of refugees. And our government has a variety of programs and some have more paperwork than others. Uh, for certain programs, you have to qualify for a certain status. Long story short, the idea to bring a plane load of refugees over didn't meet the standards that needed to be met. And, and rightfully so, because we couldn't just say, okay, here's 250 people. We have housing for you. But the, the way the programs are set up, they really want to make sure that it's not just an initial get-go. No, there's going to be a long-term commitment. There's a financial commitment. And then there are people who are are there to help them become independent. So Orphan Grain Train and, and many others shifted gears. And in the process, we were able to get more traction from local business leaders and local government leaders to say, yes, we want this. Yes, we support this. And we haven't had one person here um, say no, that's not a good idea. It's it's worked out really well, and since the folks have arrived and arrived in a few different waves, starting uh, late last summer, in our most recent one, I think was in June. Right, June this year, but June this year, our uh, la- our first one was August last year. August last year. So from August last year to about June this year, we've had several different kind of small waves of folks of an, an initial 16 people over the year, it's become about... Usually they oh, come in families. Yeah, they've so come in families, so we have around 40 now that have come. But we already have had uh, at least two families who have become ind- independent enough that some have moved on to states far away, some have moved to cities uh, nearby, and they've... Um, taking advantage of the opportunities that God has given them there. So that's kind of how we got to where we're at now. (laughs) Well, what I'm hearing you say is that uh, helping refugees relocate to a different country, and in this case, America, it's so much under the surface. You know, we see these kinds of stories on the news and just kind of assume that they assimilate rather easily when they learn the language and don't realize 
everything that goes into all of the paperwork. I know, Kelly, you've really been the paperwork guru when it comes to helping these families. The work to provide transportation, lodging, meals, health care, with so many barriers, what you're doing, what your church is doing is taking the hands of these families and vowing to walk alongside them as they temporarily relocate here. Can you tell us the difference between an immigrant and a refugee? Because there is a difference oftentimes. We had Dr. Sanchez on to talk about the Christian's care for immigrants, and it's not unlike a Christian's care for refugees, but also the way that we would view refugees would be different than immigrants who are here, ideally for them permanently. Um, Yeah, I would say that these refugees, when they came, they came with one suitcase a lot of times. And one of our families in particular said, on day two of the war, the Russian troops showed up in our town and we packed our bags and left. So for them, they, they have people back there that they said they've gone to their house. It's still there, but they have not seen their house since day two of the war. That's different than an immigrant and immigrants planned this. They wanted to come. They've been dreaming of their future in America. These refugees, it was all of a sudden they had to pack everything. And for some of them, that was one suitcase. You know, we have one little boy who he did bring his flute. He was so excited. He brought his flute, but that's all he had. You know, he just had his flute and his clothes and everything else is new. So, yeah, they left a lot and we've been trying to help them as much as we can, but they want to go home. That family in particular, their grandparents are there and they want to go back and we love them and we want them to stay, but they want to go back. And we're helping them here, but we know that if the war were to end, that family would go back. And that's okay, because that's their home, and they want to go back there. And I think that's maybe the difference between a refugee and an immigrant, is um, the refugees are not here because they were coming here for a better life. They were coming here because they were forced out of their homes. It was all of a sudden for them. All of them have lost friends or family. Some of them have lost everything that they left. Some don't know if they have lost family or friends or possessions. All of those who have come here have been Christians. And we had individuals in Ukraine connected with them and helping us know that if these families um, do move here, that they would be a benefit to society Sometimes when when people move, they bring with them other baggage, but we haven't had any any problems with the folks that have come here. Everyone's been very different. Some have had different church backgrounds, but we've been able to offer the care of Christ, and they've experienced that, and they're very much sojourners, exiles in a foreign land, but they're grateful. Uh, They've been grateful from day one. They've been grateful the whole way uh, through this just to be safe. And I would echo Kelly to say, I think most of them would like to go back, but depending on the family, some may stay, some may go. One of the challenges with the paperwork is technically they are not refugees because technically it's not a war. Without getting into any any of the politics, um, just caring for people, that is still one of the things that we faced, that because we can't call them or the government won't call them refugees, they weren't eligible for certain programs. But thankfully, the government has stepped up in other ways, and our local government found another way to to get these specific uh, folks licenses that's allowed them more freedom that essentially we set that we'd be able to give them uh, by telling them we have a safe place here. Exiles in a foreign land, that's a very biblical theme. The fact that one would sojourn in the hopes of returning to their home, we see traces of that all throughout Scripture. So how does that biblical theme of sojourner help us to understand and better care for refugees? First off, it's important to recognize that we're in the same boat 
Uh, we also are exiles in a foreign land. At the same time, the now not yet of our, our Christian life is once we were not a people, but now we are a people. So First Peter is helpful in connecting those truths. Chapter 2, verse 10 says, we're not a people, but now we are God's people. And then goes on to say that we are still sojourners and exiles. So we belong to God in this world. We are a people, even though we were not a people before, but we are still this side of heaven, sojourners and exiles. So I'll, t I'll tell a little story of what that looks like for the Ukrainians. We asked them, how did you even get here? And for those folks that were getting bombed out, um, for those folks who lived on e the eastern side of Ukraine, thinking that going away from the border of Russia would be the safest route out of their city, only to find the Russian army having kind of trapped them in, and they having to go on the back roads to get out, and their own military saying, it's up to you to decide which way to go. We asked them, how did you get here? Because every, every step of the way was treacherous. And they said, we, we prayed every step of the way. We prayed our way here. And that is how they got here. They have sadly seen a lot of things that you don't ever even want to hear uh, exists in our world, let alone see it with your own eyes, of uh, families gunned down, of mothers killed and, and children uh, left alone. Things like that that you see in documentaries or the movies and are actually happening. And here are these people who have made it all the way here or others that are still there and we're building connections or helping those connections, working through those connections to care for people. Then as the soldiers and exiles, you recognize there is a tremendous load that they're carrying and a loss, a grief. And depending on the person, they might be able to share more or, or not. But the hope that they had and the gratitude that they had exhibited their faith in Christ. And as Christians sharing in that, it's served as such a beacon of light and, and a model for us that we can easily take for granted uh, or forget that we're in the same position. Um, we just simply have it better. We don't, we don't see the things that they've seen. What is the Christian response then, care and compassion toward refugees, and what should it look like? I think for us, we always go out of our way to try and include them. Like we invite them to all of our youth group activities. We even did one um, where we tried to help our youth learn about Ukraine. Our one family came and made traditional Ukrainian dishes for them, which was really special. Like the mom helped them cook and, and we ate them. And that was a fun learning activity. They always say hi and they're very outgoing, the ones that we have. A lot of them are, the ones that we have here. Um, try to make them feel like they're just part of the church. They're not separate. Um, we do have a really hard time with certain ones. Some of them speak a lot better English than others. And so the language barrier is the, the very hardest. Um, but they know enough now to at least say hi, and they're friendly, and will shake your hand. Some of them will always give you a hug. And we want, we want them to feel like they're part of our church, even if we can't carry on a conversation with them. The general response is love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Christ gives us that second great commandment. The way that plays out is in lots of uh, daily, little, wonderful gifts of compassion for others. So last Sunday, I, I learned that several of the Ukrainians are part of a local soccer club. Football is huge around the world in ways that it's not here. And uh, we have um, international kind of flavored teams right here in town and they've been able to join in. So 
guess what? I get to go to a soccer game and, and encourage them in that part of their lives. We have, again, any number of people who have offered rides and the clothes off their back and daily support. But it's more than that. It's the encouragement that they receive through that. It's the care and comfort. So Second Corinthians is great in this. Uh, Blessed be the God and Father of all mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in every situation, right? So that we can comfort others with that same comfort. So that's that's been our response, and God be praised for that, uh, that they see Jesus more and more and less of us, but they still see Jesus. They get Jesus' chosen people, his body, to be his hands and feet. And that's pretty, that's pretty radical in a, in a world that um, is so self-centered. To learn to be part of that, it's quite a ride. And you mentioned that many of the families who have relocated to your part of the country in Nebraska are Christian families. How have you seen the gospel unite your church community with the community from Ukraine? One of the blessings of being Lutheran is we do hold up the the Unum Sanctum, like the one holy Christian and apostolic church. There is one body. And as we're gathered around the, the word, it is the word of God that unites us. The gospel of Christ is one gospel, and there is still one baptism. So... It is with all Christians. It's uh, there have been many teaching opportunities to be in God's Word and study that together and pray together and encourage. The gospel has been a great comfort for these folks. Uh, one one a specific way that we were able to offer help or and we, uh, help was offered to us was through the Lutheran Bible translators, which. You know, as a pastor, I get all sorts of emails and I hear about different organizations. And then once you actually get connected to a group, you see, wow, there's a lot here. Um, there are over a hundred different Lutheran publications in r the Russian language alone. There are dozens of Lutheran publications in the Ukrainian language alone. And it's all right there and at very low cost. To us, it's really just for a donation of your choice. And so we've been able to get Bibles, um, catechisms, and a variety of other resources that they already already had prepared and even meet with some of those folks together. Um, Matt Heisey and his wife happened to be in Seward around the same time that I was trying to find resources and we had a mutual connection. I was able to go down and see a presentation of that uh, Dr. Heisey was was offering, learn about the church through the communist era in Russia and what it's like now. So the, the resources, the gospel, the word of God has been a central uh, place. And uh, Google Translate's only good. So thankfully, as we receive care and comfort and a blessing from the people, we invested even more. I tried learning Russian because um, those from Eastern Ukraine pretty much only knew Russian. Even though they're Ukrainian, they have the Russian language, which is different from Ukrainian. There are similarities. Uh, one of the fathers of the family gave me a Russian Bible, and when he gave it to me, I, I told myself, I'm going to learn Russian. <laughs> so wow. uh, I, I found one of those translator apps from my phone and every day for a long time, I was trying to learn Russian. Um, I cannot read hardly anything yet and speak hardly anything yet, but the gesture meant something, both the Russian Bible to us and our attempt to, to try and learn their language. They're learning English much faster because they're immersed. But whenever we get together, there's been a blessing there, and uh, even more so as we've been able to read scripture together. Yeah. Oftentimes we'll read in one language and then read the same in the other language. And we'll, in our gathering on 
Friday nights twice a month with some deep Bible study. We ask them how they're doing, what their needs are, but they're the ones that ask for, can we be in scripture together and prayer together? We, we need this to feed us. And that's been just a, a wonderful, wonderful thing for them and us. And so we'll, uh, we'll gather and we'll read different sections of scripture and pray for their various needs and other things that are going on. And you see how Jesus is bringing them the comfort that they need through the gospel. We've been very blessed to have one family in particular who can translate to. Yes. <laughs> I don't know how this whole thing would have turned out had we not had the Kovals so that hard. can translate. Yeah. Um, they were English teachers, I believe. At least one of them was an English teacher in Ukraine. So yeah, what they are... can understand anything we say and they can translate anything we say to anyone else. So what are the odds that if 40 people that come over, uh, a couple is uh, fluent, uh, in English. fluent in English and, and fluent in Russian and fluent in Ukrainian and probably can speak other languages as well. Yeah. Uh, they've been able to help our students who are up at Lutheran High to learn their subjects better and translating their subjects for them. They've been uh, key figures in our conversations anytime we have a conversation and they never tire of it they are just glad to be here and helping each other and helping us to help them well that's by god's grace i yes. mean he works all things uh for good and also cares for his people even as they sojourn and, and travel right so what a testament to his promise to be with his people Kelly and Pastor, what have you learned from the folks from Ukraine, and what has your church learned by caring for them? I didn't know a whole lot about what it was like to meet people from other cultures, I guess. Um, getting to know them and learning about their way of life has been really interesting. And knowing them day to day for a long period of time, not just seeing them once. And that has been a good experience. Our kids too have really enjoyed getting to know them. And they now know words in Ukrainian that for them, that it's, it's a normal thing. They can say hi to the, their friends from Ukraine. And I think they also understand a little bit better about what it's like to come to the new a new country like they don't know a lot about the war in Ukraine especially our little ones they have no idea but they understand what it's like for these families to move to a new place they understand what it was like for them to come with one suitcase and to have everything different and changed and that's been good for them another thing our church does through Open Grain Train is pack christmas boxes to send to other countries which is a similar idea in the sense that we give away toys and shirts and our kids give their toys and shirts. And um, we actually gave them to the Ukrainians last year when they came and to give them to someone that's an actual person that you see is different um, than just sending them away. So I think to make that real connection to helping a real person, this is an actual person that's on the other end. So I would say the outreach portion of it is the biggest difference um, in my life is having a, a physical person to make a difference in their life. I think we've also, along with that, learned uh, patience, especially when there are technical difficulties with Google Translate. Google Translate is wonderful. It is wonderful. However, you can ask the same question three times and get three different answers. Uh, we've learned to adapt and to not assume that we know what others are going through. We've been inspired by the resiliency of, of people going through some really hard times. We've been surprised at how very different all the people are uh, who, who have come here. Uh, every single one is very different. So kind of the, the, you know, generalizations that you think of other cultures 
That shouldn't surprise us, though, because all Americans are different, too. Yeah, like even your own kids and your own family. <laughs> Same two parents. Every kid is a different personality. And so Ukrainians and, are the same way. And it's very similar. And they have different likes and dislikes. Our church has really stepped up to the plate, along with other churches, to be humble and giving and sacrificial uh, in very real ways. And for the long term, too. Yeah. Um, this is not something that was a month-long project. It's still ongoing, and we're over a year into it. When we started talking about this, it was last February. Was it like a year and some ago, February, mm -hmm. maybe? This is not a short-term mission trip. It's mm -hmm. very much a long-term mission work right on our doorstep, and it's a beautiful thing. And they're still here, and they will still be here yeah. for I don't even know how long. I think one of the, the best things we've learned is that we can actually do this. There was so much red tape and so much paperwork that could could make someone feel like this is impossible. But with God, we've found this is actually very possible. Uh, we, we look back at the initial timeline and the, the very first plan, that didn't work. And then once we found out, you know, we need to go through another program, I was expecting maybe we'd have one family in six to nine months, you know, by Christmas time. And then we got five, five families time. by August. And then more families uh, another month later. And there still has been this kind of continual flow of families arriving and God has provided for everyone every single time. And so one of my big takeaways, and I think for the church too, is, wow, we can actually do this because God can do this. Do you have any advice for listeners, either as individuals or as part of their community and their church who might be interested in getting involved in similar work and sharing Christ's love and mercy with refugees? It is a big commitment and you will need a lot of people. For us, it's really been a community wide. Um, our initial group, that first five families we brought in, I think we had five or six churches worth of people helping for that initial to set up. Now the one family that came at a time afterwards, we knew what we were doing a little bit better and we didn't need so much support. Um, but you need a lot of people because there's a lot of little things that need to be done and it's ongoing. So it's not a month long, you know, mission work. It's going to be years. So you have to be willing to commit for years and it's frustrating sometimes and it's hard and it's also well worth it. You make a big difference. I would say for that, that one family that the Russian troops showed up on day two. They are here and all of their kids are doing well. They face daily challenges, depending on which kid and which day. And But they're alive and they're going to school and they're growing. And they come to church. We see them every week. And none of that would have been possible there. And yes, they'll probably go back. And we won't know them when they're 20, but that's okay. I'd say, too, that um, even if it's not for Ukrainians, there are others all right around you who need Christ. And simply caring for one person uh, at a time is, is worth it in a good focus. I had someone in my office yesterday I haven't seen in a while, and that reminded me why I'm here. And it's like leaving the 99 for the one and you go search for the one who's the one and sometimes they're from another country sometimes a country in the midst of war a lot of times it's just from another family or a co-worker right in town and there are opportunities all right around that god invites us even commands us tells us encourages us to pray for those opportunities and trust that he's able to provide and to work through us as his hands and feet. So step out in faith 
and uh, look for those people. And uh, if there are specific individuals or jer- groups or churches out there looking to to help with those refugees that we've spoken of and in others, there are ways to help. And uh, you want to have the community support uh, your local leaders, your your church communities. Just start asking questions. Start getting connected to the people who know the answers to those. And talk with others like us or, or other organizations. There are hundreds of organizations doing the same thing or, or similar things and see how it's worked for them. Since February of 2022, the war in Ukraine has displaced over 10 million people, nearly half of those being children. And so the LCMS Office of National Missions Human Care and Ministerial Support Team is offering a new grant program to assist interested individuals, congregations, even districts and RSOs with sponsorship of Ukrainian refugees who are coming into the U.S. And so I would just like to share that grant funds can be accessed by going online. You can reach out to the LCMS Ukraine Project Consultant Deaconess Lorraine Roach at Human care at lcms.org, or you can search for LCMS Ukraine Refugee Grant Program. Grant funds can be used to help sponsor refugees with the cost of housing, as you mentioned, transportation, food, furnishings, all of the things that go into caring for these families. So, Pastor and Kelly, I want to thank you for joining us today and for sharing your experience with the families who are sojourning there in Nebraska. And thank you for also sharing your love, your care, and your compassion for the people of God. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. And don't forget to click the follow or subscribe button so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. New episodes drop twice each month. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram as Friends for Life LCMS. And finally, listeners, we want to hear from you. Do you have an idea about a guest you'd like to hear from or a topic you want talked about? Email us at friendsforlife at lcms.org. We want to hear from you about what you want to hear about when it comes to issues of life. Thanks for joining us. Friends for Life is a podcast that introduces listeners to life issues by introducing them to friends who stand for life. Thank you.